जय श्री श्री गुरु गौरंग गंधार्व के गिरधारी श्री श्री राधा विनोद बिहारी जु की जय नित्यलीला प्रविष्ट ओम विष्णु पाद स्तोत्र शिष्यमाद रूप अनुचारी वर्य शिल भक्ति वेदांत नारायण गोस्वामी महाराज की जय नित्यलीला प्रविष्ट ओम विष्णु पाद स्तोत्र सद शिष्यमाद भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी प्रभु पाद की जय नित्यलीला प्रविष्ट ओम विष्णु पाद स्तोत्र शिष्यमाद भक्ति प्रज्ञान केशव गोस्वामी महाराज की जय जय शिल भक्ति सिद्धांत सरस्वती ठाकुर जगत गुरु श्री प्रपाद की जय महाभगवाश गोपुरराज की जाय सप्तम गोस्वामी सचन तक्र भक्ति नोद की जाय श्री रूपानुग गौर गुरु वाग की जाय प्रेम स गो श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु नित्यानंद श्रिया द्वैत गदाधर शिवा सरी गौर भक्त वृंद की जय श्री ब्रज मंडल क्षेत्र मंद गौर मंडल की जय त्रिभुवन मंगल करे श्री हरि नाम संकीर्तन की जाय ग्रंथराज श्रीमद भागवत की जाय अनंत कोटि वैष्णव वृंद की जाय समग्र भक्त शचिपुत्र अत्रुपुरीपुरी मातुरी को कुंद मगिरीवर अहो राधिका मृतूयस प्रतीत कृपया श्री गुरु तम तोस्म गुरव गौरचंद्रा राधिकाए तले कृष्णा कृष्ण भक्ताय भक्ताय नमो आनंद लीलमाय विग्रहाय हेम दिव्यसुंदराय तस्म महाप्रेम रस प्रदाय चैतन्य चंद्राय नमो नमस्ते चैतन्य चंद्राय नमो नमस्ते चैतन्य चंद्राय नमो नमस्ते श्याम सुंदर शिखंड शिखर स्मरहा सुमुरली मनोहरा राधिक रस कम कृप निधे स्वप्रिय चरण किं क्रीम कुरु तवैवस्मी तवैवस्मी नाजवा मेत्या विनाख्याय देवी तम नमा चरणस्ट वो आई ऑफ माई सस्तंग दंड पुष्पांजलि माई हार्ट लाइक फ्लावर्स थाउजेंड्स ऑफ टाइम्स At the lotus feet of my holy master, my supremely worshipable spiritual Guru Dev, Asmadi Parmarada Tam Guru Pada Padma, Nitilila Parvist Om Vishnu Pad, Ashtotra Satasi Rupanuga Chari Varya, Shila Bhakti Vedanta Narayan Goswami Maharaj. Secondly, I offer my pranam thousands of times at the lotus feet of my Param Guru Dev to Shila Prabhupada. and all of our sri rupanuga gaudiya guru parampara and finally i offer my pranam to all the assembled vaishnavas and vaishnavis vanchakalpa turugasya kripa sindhu vyavacha putitanam pavane bhyo vaishnavi bhyo namo nama so i was informed that you have been discussing bhagavad gita uh, chapter 9 So Bhagavad Gita has 18 chapters and the first six chapters mainly focus on the discussion of uh, karma yoga the last six chapters focus on the tatva gyan and the middle six chapters they are where sri krishna has kept the treasure of pure bhakti especially because uh, the one analogy has been given that if there's a treasure chest then there is the the base of the treasure chest then there is the lid of the treasure chest but the treasure is in the middle so in the same way the first six and the last six chapters are like the base and the lid and the middle six chapters of bhagavad gita are compared to the treasure kept within that chest and among these middle uh, chapters then nine 
chapter 9 is exactly in the very center, the, the heart of Bhagavad Gita. So this chapter is known as Raja Guya Yoga, or um, the yoga which is the king of all secrets. So when Sri Krishna speaks, or he wants to present some knowledge, then it's his habit that, and this is also a Vedic um, tradition, that before speaking some knowledge, one must glorify the nature of that knowledge to create the fascination, the enthusiasm, the interest to hear it. Uh, and also describe who is qualified and who is unqualified to uh, receive that knowledge. So, see, Krishna begins in the first verse, Sri Bhagavan Idam te tu te guyatamam parakshami yanusuyavi gyanam vikyana sahitam yazgatva makshate sheshubhat. He's saying, Hey Arjun, idam tu te guyatamam. This knowledge that I am describing is guyatamam, most confidential. Most secret. Pra pravaksha me. And I will explain it to you. Why? Anasu Yave. Because you are not envious of me. Hmm? Asuya means uh, hostility or envy. And Anasuya means uh, you are without hostility towards me. Hmm? In this world, the living entities have so many. Uh, an artist. Jayato Vishampung Sam Sangas Teshu Pajayate. See, Krishna said that by meditating on the objects of the senses, then one develops attachment for them. Then from that attachment comes the calm, desire. And uh, from this desire, when it's unfulfilled, comes anger. And uh, then there is the uh, bewilderment of memory and one falls down so these are the uh, stages through which the soul who is spiritual and transcendental is involved in the world is embedded in the darkness of ignorance by first meditating on the external objects becoming attached to them mm -hmm. Sangat Sanjay te kama kama kroda bijayate nkroda bhavati samoha samohat smriti vibrama smriti brangsad buddhi nasho. When one's uh, memory, one's intelligence becomes bewildered, then there is a complete destruction, buddhi nash, destruction of intelligence. So this destruction of intelligence is actually. The asuya, enviousness. Enviousness uh, towards other living beings. Enviousness uh, ultimately towards God. Uh, this is the uh, most condensed form of anatta. And so, those who have this uh, hostility towards other living beings, and which is ultimately a hostility towards God himself, and his energy, his uh, creation. So uh, they, ha they have all other uh, faults as well. One may say, well, I don't get angry, um, I don't become lusty, or whatever. But if one has enmity towards any living being, hostility towards any living being, then it's to be considered that all the other faults are included in that. And this is why Sri Chaitanya Mahapu said, Tanada peace, Suni Chena, Tora peace, Eshuna, Amani Namana Dena, Kirtanya Sada Hari. To chant the holy names continuously, one should consider oneself quite insignificant, more insignificant than a blade of grass. One should tolerate all difficulties, considering that no one is the cause of my suffering but myself. I have no one to blame but myself. And one should give respect to every living entity 
and not demand that they should give respect to us. These are the symptoms of the person who is the anasuya, without hostility, without the spirit of uh, revenge, uh, revenge, and one who is non-envious. So here in the beginning of chapter 9, which is especially on the confidential knowledge of devotional service, Krishna is saying, Arjun, I am explaining this to you because you are a very harmless person. You are not envious towards others in any way. Of course, Arjun is a powerful warrior, and, uh, but in the course of his whatever fighting he may do, he never does that fighting out of enmity, but only out of a sense of duty and service to Sri Krishna. So, Krishna is saying, Jnana Vijnana Sahitam. This knowledge is imbued with Gyan and Vigyan. Yajgatva Mokshaste Shubhat. And if you know this, when you know this, then one will be liberated from Ashubha, everything which is inauspicious. So that is uh, desirable for everyone. Everyone wants to become free from inauspiciousness in their life. And so see Krishna is saying here, this is how you do it, by understanding this knowledge. And this knowledge has uh, two parts, Gyan and Vigyan. The knowledge of Bhakti includes uh, two other types of knowledge, that is Gyan and Vigyan. So in this context, we should know that Gyan means the knowledge and realization of Sri Krishna's Swarup, His divine form. This is, uh, cannot be stressed enough. It's a great obstacle for a person to not accept that God has, has, is a transcendental, eternal, everlasting, inexhaustible, unlimitedly beautiful, unlimitedly sweet spiritual form, which is human-like. Generally, because of our material experience, we know that the things around us that have form are all limited. And so we make the mistake of thinking, oh, God cannot have a form because a form is a limitation. So in this chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna goes to a great length to explain that his form is not like any material form. For example, he will say, Maya tatam idam savam jagata vyakta murtina. By my form, spiritual form, which is not manifest to the senses of the people of this world, the entire universe is uh, pervaded everywhere. I am everywhere. So even though Sri Krishna has uh, a form which is human-like, medium-sized, if you will, uh, but still, that form is everywhere. And that's very important to know because it means that if someone wants to serve Krishna, then they don't have to go far to find him because wherever you are, wherever a person is engaged in devotion, then see Krishna, he's there and see Krishna is with you and he's ready to accept our loving services. So in this chapter of Bhagavad Gita, see Krishna will explain the consequences of not uh, accepting on the authority of the Vedas, on the authority of Guru and Guru Prampara, the uh, reality of his beautiful transcendental form. Krishna will say, Mogasha Moga Kamano, Moga Jnana Vicheta Saha, Rakshasim Asurim Chaiva, Moginim Prakritim Sritaha. If a person will say, Oh, it may be that God can do anything and be unlimited, but he cannot have a, a human-like form. <laughs> then what will be the result of that? Mogasha, moga kamano. Whatever they uh, aspire for, it will be unsuccessful. They'll never achieve it. Whatever karma they perform to go to heaven uh, in their next life, 
their karma will not bring fruit. All their cultivation of any type of knowledge will be completely ruined. And actually, they will become rakshasam, asrim chaiva. They will develop the nature of demons. In other words, they will be infused with enmity towards not only to God, but towards other living entities as well, and have a demonic and a materialistic mentality. This is the result of not uh, accepting the uh, authority of the Vedic revelation and the testimony of Sri Guru and the Guru Parampara. So, Jnanam Vigyana Sahitam. Jnan here means the knowledge of Krishna's own Swarup. And Vigyan means the knowledge of the Shaktis of God and how God interacts with his Shaktis. In other words, there is a Tatasta Shakti uh, that is the marginal potency from which all souls, jivas, living entities are manifest. Then there is the Bahiranga Shakti, the external energy. Uh, the material energy, and there is the Antaranga Shakti, the internal potency of Sri Krishna, uh, of which Bhakti, devotion, is the very essence. So, Sri Krishna, in this very first verse, is giving a beautiful summary or a, a table of contents, if you like, for the uh, his whole presentation that he will speak now, because Sri Krishna will explain his relationship with the material energy and the living entities Sri Krishna says I am pervading everything all beings are in me and all the elements are in me but I am not in them then Sri Krishna says Nacha Matstani Bhutani and all elements and all beings are also not in me. So this is not easy. In fact, it's quite impossible for the material intelligence to understand. But if one will uh, contemplate it uh, according to the revelation of Krishna's words in Bhagavad Gita, then you can get some idea, but still you'll not be able to understand. How will understanding come? Uh, only through Shuddha Bhakti. Pure bhakti, which is of the nature of the essence of Samvit and Ladini. Samvit Shakti is the self revelatory power of the spiritual energy which causes revelation, realization. It is only through the power of Samvit Shakti that these transcendental truths about Krishna's relationship with his energies uh, can be directly realized, directly understood. So, See, Krishna in this chapter 9 will exactly describe his relationship with each one of his energies. Everything is within Krishna in the way that the wind is accommodated by space. Wind is blowing everywhere, moving around, but it's moving within space. But space itself can never be affected by uh, the wind. So in the same way, though everything is moving within Sri Krishna, and Sri Krishna's form is everywhere, he's completely uh, unaffected, untouched by that. And at, at the same time, Sri Krishna says, Nachamatstani Bhutani, everything is not in me. So this seems contradictory, but the meaning is this, that Sri Krishna has no attachment uh, to the very world for which he is the Nimitta Karan, the instrumental cause. This is very fascinating. So Sri Krishna is saying, Bhuta Brinnacha Bhuta Sto, Mama Bhuta, that Bhuta Brinnacha Bhuta Sto, Mama Bhuta Bhavanaha. The meaning is that Bhuta Brin, I am the support of all the material energy. Bhuta Bhavana, I am the maintainer of the material energy. 
But I am not situated in it in the sense that I have no attachment for it. So Sri Krishna is saying, yoga maishwaram. just see my mystic opulence. Because for other living entities, uh, they cannot do this. You see, for example, we are a soul. Soul is also transcendental. Soul is not part of the body at all. But when the soul is, uh, is consciousness of the soul, is engaged in the activities of maintaining, nourishing, and supporting the material body on a day-to-day -day basis, then we become attached. So that's the difference. See, Krishna, he, though he's supporting and maintaining and nourishing everything, but he's not attached to anything. That is his mystic opulence. And that mystic opulence really means his uh, maya, his, that his shaktis are doing everything according to his desire. So he's not involved. So this is a very uh, wonderful thing to understand. The relationship of God with his external material energy. So Krishna even in this chapter said, I am Udasinavat. Udasin means indifferent. In other words, so many things are going on in the world, but Krishna is indifferent to that. This is very shocking for some persons because they think that God should be um, watching carefully everything and become very emotionally involved in all small details. But Krishna said, Udasinavat. I am uh, as if Udasin, completely indifferent. So here, Vat means like, like indifferent, not actually indifferent. Why is it that he's not completely indifferent to all the things which are going on in the world, but he's Udasinavat? Because Samoham Sarabhu Teshu, Name Dreshtios Tina Priya, that I am equal to everyone. I am not against anyone. I am not um, pro anyone. I am not anti anyone. But ye bhajanti to mambaktya mai te te shu chasraham. That means that, but if someone is my devotee and is rendering service to me, then he is in me and I am in him. So this is very important to understand. When Krishna is speaking about that he's not in something or something is not in him, what he means to say is that he's not attached to it. But here when he's speaking to, about his devotee, he's saying the devotee is in me and I am in them. That means that my devotee is attached to me and I am attached to my devotee. It's a little like saying, if someone asks, Oh, did you come to America alone? Then I may say, no, I came with my wife, Swanalata Dasi. Then someone may say, oh, did you hire a private plane? And we say, no, we came on a very big British airway, 777 with about 500 other people. Then why did you say that you only came with your wife? Why? Because I have no relation with anyone else on the plane. I am related to my wife like this. So this is a Krishna speaking uh, in the sense of uh, devotion. That is that all the things are going on in the world, but I am indifferent. All the living entities who are envious of each other and me, I am also not involved in them. But if someone in this world is serving me, is dedicated to me, then I am attached to them and they are attached to me. So this is what Sri Krishna means in, in the beginning of chapter 9 when he says, Jnanam Vigyana Sahitam. This knowledge of bhakti is uh, imbued with knowledge of my spiritual form. And by bhakti, you will also understand how I am aloof from and unattached to the dealings of the world, but I am very attached to my uh, devotees. So, Krishna goes on to explain Raja Vidya, Raja Guyam, Pavitram Idam Uttamam, Pratyakshavagamam Dharmam, Susukam Kartumabhyayam. 
This knowledge is Raja Vidya, the king of all knowledge, and Raja Guya. It is the king of all. The, the, the video? So, in the first verse, Sri Krishna had explained that I am telling you this, Arjun, because you are not envious. So, this knowledge is never given, it's never imparted by the Guru to a disciple who is uh, not uh, soft hearted. Shonaka Rishi said uh, to Sutta Goswami in the beginning of Srimad Bhagavatam, Veta Tvam Somya Tat Sarvam Tat Patasta Danugrahat Bru Yusnik Dasasya Guru Vogu Yama Pirta. Oh, Sutta Goswami, I know that you have Guya, you have divine transcendental knowledge, you have confidential knowledge, uh, because you have received the mercy of your gurus. And the reason that you have received the mercy of your gurus, is because a guru always reveals the transcendental knowledge to the disciple who is snigda. Snigda is a very beautiful word. It can mean affectionate, but it means really um, smooth or oily or greasy, like ghee. Ghee is very, very soft. If you touch it, it's just... It's completely pliable, completely smooth, like that. So when the disciple is uh, not uh, aggressive, is not contrary, is not uh, prickly, but the disciple is very soft and smooth he, in his relationship with the virtual master, very uh, pliable to the instructions and the uh, uh, the desires of the spiritual master, then for sure this knowledge is imparted to such a disciple because that person is truly the anusuya, free from hostility and free from uh, any enviousness. So Krishna said, Raja Vidya, this knowledge that I will explain to you, Arjun, is the king of Vidya. The word Vidya means knowledge. Very fascinating. Generally, people take knowledge to mean information or data. But in the spiritual, paramartic sense, it is explained in Srimad Bhagavatam, Sa Vidya Tanmatir Yaya. Knowledge is how to be Tanmai. Tanmai means avesh, absorption. How the mind, how the heart, one's consciousness can be fully saturated, fully absorbed in uh, thoughts of Sri Krishna, that is really vidya. How to be tanmai, sa vidya tanmatiryaya. So we see in Srimad Bhagavatam, the beautiful uh, example of when See Krishna during the day, he goes to the forest with his friends and he's uh, playing upon his flute and he's taking the cows here and there and Braj Gopis are in their homes and they're talking to each other and expressing such uh, beautiful sentiments. And more than expressing beautiful sentiments, they're actually hiding their love and speaking about other things. But somewhere that their love is peeping through. One gopi is saying, Oh, Saki, just see how, see Krishna, he, when he's playing his flute, it's the middle of the day, and uh, the sun is shining very, very um, intensely, and the rays of the sun are quite harsh and, and burning to the skin. But 
Dristata pay braja pasun saharama go pai. At that time, when Krishna begins to play his flute, then prema pravridda, there are clouds in the sky. And the cloud seemed uh, not so big, but suddenly the cloud began to expand and spread its shade all over Sri Krishna and his friends and the cows and protect him from the harsh rays of the sun, just like an umbrella. So the gopi is thinking, just see, this cloud is Krishna's friend because see Krishna is Ganasham. He has a complexion like a rain cloud and the cloud has a complexion like Krishna. So they must be friends because they, they have a, this similarity. And what is the mm, essence of friendship? Really, the essence of friendship is not hanging out together or whatever. The essence of friendship is um, Tatsuka Suki Bhav. That means Tatsuk, the happiness of my friend. Suki is my happiness. So Tatsuka Suka bha, Suki Bhav, the, the feeling that I am happy when my friend is happy. So because the, the clouds see that Krishna may be, feel some inconvenience from the sun, then the cloud himself is spreading himself out. Gopis are saying, Prima Pravridha. Why did the cloud become big? Because his love is increasing. His love is expanding. And that is causing his body to expand. And he's becoming mm, the Sakya Vyadat Swa mm, Vapusambuddha Atapra Swa Vapusa. That means his own body is becoming like an umbrella to protect Sri Krishna. So in this way, Braj Gopis, it seems as if they're describing the clouds. Now, whether the clouds are actually feeling in this way or not is uh, not the issue here. The issue is that when someone has brain, then Sarabha Bhuteshu Ya Pasyat Bhagavat Bhavam Atmanaha Bhutana Bhagavat Yatma Esha Bhagavat Uttama that one who has love then he feels himself Premara Swabhava Yaham Premara Sambandha Say Mani Krishna Mori Nahi Prema Ganda one who has a real love for Krishna feels that he himself has no love but sees the love that he has in others so gopis seeing the clouds make a shade above the head of Krishna they're thinking ah how much love the cloud has for Krishna. So they're seeing their own love in the cloud. They're hiding their own desire also because gopis are feeling some sadness. Oh, see Krishna, by now he must be walking in the hot heat of the sun and gopis themselves by their own body, they want to protect the body of Krishna and give all happiness to him. But they cannot say that openly. Uh, so, because praying is not directly expressed. So they're glorifying the clouds. And uh, from this avahitta bhav, the concealment of their emotions, we can recognize that this is actually their mood. Eh? Just like when Sri Krishna was blessed by Radhika with her bhav, and he appeared as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, then Radharani was thinking, oh, if he'll experience my love, then he'll faint, he'll fall on the ground and he may be injured. So I should cover his body completely with my own golden complexion. So uh, Shamsunda became Gorasunda, covered with the golden complexion of Radhika because she has that intense feeling of love that Krishna should not suffer, Krishna should not experience any inconvenience. Let me take all inconveniences upon myself. And if Krishna will be happy, then my own suffering even will be the cause of my happiness. So I'm just giving an example. How just remembering Krishna, hearing the sound of his flute, seeing the clouds, Braj Gopis become completely avesh, absorbed, tanmai. In fact, in the last verse of that uh, chapter, 
Sri Shukadev Goswami Pad. He said, Evam Vidha Bhagavato Ya Brindavana Charina Vanayantyo Mito Gopya Kridas Tanmayatam Yayahu Tanmayatam Tanmay. Shukadev Goswami himself is saying that in this way, when the gopis were in their homes and they were talking to each other, describing uh, how Sri Krishna plays his flute and, and uh, how the cows and the rivers and the birds and the clouds and the Govardhan and his friends, how everyone responds to his beauty and his flute singing. As the gopis were just discussing this with each other, then Kridas Tanmaya Tamya Yu, they became Tanmai, Tanmai, that is Avesh, absorbed in his pastimes. So Tanmai is the definition of Vidya. So see, Krishna is saying here in the beginning of chapter 9, Raja Vidya, this is the king of all knowledge. Why? Because see, Krishna is going to describe the glories of bhakti by which one becomes tanmai, absorbed in Krishna. He will say, Satatam kirtayantomam yatanchas chadrida brataha namasyantastamam bhaktya nitya yukta upasate. The great souls, they always engage in kirtan. The great souls, they are always uh, uh, bowing down to me. They're endeavoring making strong endeavors, yatanta, means I must complete my fixed number of rounds every day. I must complete my recitation of prayers every day. I must study the Shastra and learn verses every day. I must follow a Kadasi. It is imperative. I must endeavor to do all of these things. Yatanta, dridabrata, endeavoring with strong determination. Namasyantasta, Mambhaktya, and with great devotion, bowing down again and again, uh, giving up all uh, uh, identification and attachment to external physical body and mind. Nitya yukta upasate. They are always nitya yukta. They are united with me. Hmm? So here, Raja Vidya, Raja Guyam. Raja Guyam. This is the king of secrets. Because knowledge of Atma, is known by the Brahmavadis. Knowledge of Brahman may be known to Jnanis. Knowledge of Paramatma may be known to the yogis. But this knowledge of Bhakti is only known to the devotees and no one else. So this is Rajaguya, the greatest secret. And it really is a secret. That is something quite tremendous. How secret... It is. Uh, we are singing songs, like in the morning, we say, Mahaprabhu Kirtana Nitya Gita Vaditra Madhyan Manasura Sena Roman Chakampa Srutaranga Bajo Vande Guru Sri Charanaravinda I bow down to my Gurudev. He is such a person that he is always engaged in uh, singing playing musical instruments and glorifying the pastimes of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And when doing so, his hair stand on end, tears flow from his eyes, he's trembling and uh, feeling great joy within. So these are things that can be seen. But what cannot be seen is when the devotee is doing bhajan in this way, that Sri Krishna or Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is actually coming to him speaking to him, caressing him, uh, opening heart to him, mm, engaging that devotee in his loving service. Uh, who can see it? No one can see it. So it's a great secret. Mm. Mm -hmm. Who can know it? One may say, why should I accept these uh, words of Bhagavad Gita? I am very logical, rational, and scientific. For science, there should be some, to accept something, there should be some verification. It should be verified. Or that which is scientific 
can be, uh, there should be falsification. It should be possible to falsify. But the claims that Sri Krishna is making in Bhagavad Gita, how can we verify them? Hmm? They cannot be uh, falsified. So we don't accept that this is Raja Vidya, the highest science. Hmm? People can uh, speak like this. But actually, uh, this is uh, not true. Uh, bhakti can be verified. Those who practice bhakti for many years, undergoing self-sacrifice, tolerating all difficulties in the service of the spiritual master, and keeping complete dedication to the chanting of the holy name, then those persons have testified that after some time, once the anartas are removed and the surup, the true nature of pure bhakti begins to make its appearance, that yes, everything is true. Krishna is Supreme Lord. And by devotion, you can see him, you can meet with him, you can speak with him. He becomes your nearest and dearest and exclusive object of all love. It's verifiable. Someone may say, oh, but you're making claims that cannot be falsified. But the thing is this. If, you want, if someone will try to falsify the claim, that means they'll have to practice bhakti every day of their life for many, many years. And if at the end of their life, then they find that they did not realize Krishna, then they can say that uh, it has been falsified. So, uh, persons who say that bhakti is not scientific, uh, that uh, we should not accept this because it can neither be verified or, or falsified. Uh, the, uh, their words are not acceptable because bhakti is both verifiable and uh, one may try to falsify it but one will fail but it can only be verified or shown to be uh, unfalsifiable by a person who has a sraddha faith if a person has sadhu sangha and by great fortune develops the Vishesh Sanskar, the intense impression, I want to serve Krishna, and they dedicate their life fully, day by day by day, then that person will both verify uh, the um, existence of Sri Krishna and the power of Bhakti, and uh, also show that uh, it, is, it, it is not defined by uh, this practice. But the common person does not have the opportunity to invest. Uh, they don't have the time, the energy, the commitment. They are distracted by other things. And therefore, they can never invest sufficiently in order to realize the truths of devotion. Mm -hmm. And so what is it that makes a person invest in this path of bhakti? And that is a sraddha, faith. And that sraddha is an intense impression, the vishesh sanskar that comes only by mercy. When one uh, serves the spiritual master and is blessed by the spiritual master, that impression comes and one becomes fully invested in the path. And as Supreme Lord himself has said, mai nirbada ridayaha sadavaha samadarshanaha Vasi Kurvamti Mam Bhaktya Satpatim Yata Satpatim Satsriya The meaning is that Krishna said, My devotee, he binds me up, he brings me under his control within his heart. I cannot leave him for a moment. Why? just as a faithful wife very humbly and submissively is serving her husband day after day week after week month after month year after year and after some time then the husband becomes completely under her control he will not do anything or even think anything without considering in her first and taking her permission so in the same way when one has faith and invests his life in Krishna's service day by day, gradually, gradually, gradually. See Krishna, who is, who is Kritagya, extremely grateful and extremely soft-hearted. 
for whom if you serve him just a little service, then he remembers that and his gratitude for that service grows day by day. Then that very Krishna, he can no longer hide from his devotee. He can no longer conceal himself from his devotee. And very lovingly, he approaches his devotee with tears in his eyes and says, Mama Sirisi Mandanam Dehi Padava Palava Mudharam. Oh, my dear devotee. Excuse me that I took so long in coming. I'm bowing down to you. Please decorate my head with your lotus feet because I am feeling separation from you. And when that happens to a devotee, even if other persons are in the room, when Sri Krishna approaches him, no one will see anything. No one will know anything. No one will be any the wiser. Why? Raja Vidya, Raja Guyam. Bhakti is Raja Guyam, the king of all secrets. It is known only to those to whom Sri Krishna reveals himself. So Sri Krishna is saying, Raja Vidya, Raja Guyam, Pavitram, Idam Uttamam. This Bhakti is the topmost pure. Mm. Phenomena. Pavitram idam uttamam. There is nothing more pure than bhakti. What does that mean? Hmm. Well, first of all, if one wants to try to realize Brahman by the practice of jnana yoga, then actually even cannot take the practice of jnana yoga without being purified first by the practice of nishkarma karma yoga performing one's duties without attachment to the fruit slowly slowly one will become more and more sattvic and then in a very high level of sattva then one can take up the path of jnana yoga and renounce the world and perform the relevant austerities and so on whereas bhakti is so pure that even a fallen person a contaminated person can immediately practice bhakti and very soon they can attain the result. So bhakti is most purifying. In addition to that, we can say that by performing bhakti, then aparabdham palam, you have aparabdha karma, Aparabdham palam papam. Sins are of the four stages. Kulta bija falon mukam. Kramaneva praliyate vishnu bhakti ratatmanaha. First, we have the aparabdha karma. That those are the sinful reactions that you will not experience in this life. They're standing in a queue and you'll experience them in your next life. Then we have the falum mukam, the sins that one is experiencing just now, the moment by moment, the reactions to our past activities that we're experiencing now. Then we have the beach, the seed of sins, which we're experiencing now in the form of desires that we have not yet acted upon. And then we have desires which have not even manifest in our mind. They are in the in a state uh, which is very very uh, just potential states and those de those will manifest in the form of sinful desires in the future so that is called uh, kut so sinful reactions or the contamination of the soul which uh, keeps us from transcendental realization uh, realizing that we are even are a soul then these four types of sins, they are completely destroyed by the practice of bhakti. Not only the reactions of sins, not only the sinful activities that we could be involved in just now, but bhakti will save us, but even the papa bij, the seed of sin, the impressions in the heart, and also more deeply than that, the avidya, the ignorance, that is the vimukata, the indifference to God, which is the cause of our entanglement in our material, in material existence. This is all completely destroyed 
by the practice of bhakti and therefore see krishna very confidently he's saying pavitram idam uttamam this practice of bhakti is the most pure pratyakshavagamam hmm? dharmyam this is the prakshat pratyaksha avagamam that means that bhakti gives us realization pratyaksha pratyaksha means direct perception so in Srimad Bhagavatam it is stated bhakti parushanu bhavo bhakti anyacha traika trika ekakala prapadyamanasya yathasatasyus Pusti pusti kshud apayo nugahasam. How do you know that you have eaten? So that is very simple. If you have a plate of food and you begin to eat, then you experience three things. One, the pleasure uh, which comes. That is called tushti, satisfaction. The satisfaction, the pleasure of eating. And then pushti. Pushti means nourishment, that you feel energy, strength coming to you. And then shuddha, uh, apayo. That means the disappearance of, you had hunger, but now the hunger is going away. So from eating, there are three results. Tushti, you feel satisfaction, some pleasure. Pushti, you feel strength, you feel nourished. And shuddha, apayo the disappearance of hunger. So in the same way, when a person is surrendering, uh, then they attain three things, bhakti, pareshanu bhavo, virakti. So the first one, bhakti, here means the uh, pleasure or the satisfaction of devotional service. Devotional service gives great joy. Why? Because it is of, by its very nature, it is Swarup of Sambit and Ladini, that is Krishna's self revealing potency and Ladini, Krishna's pleasure potency. So, when a devotee is engaged in bhakti, then he naturally experiences the pleasure, satisfaction, tushti. Then, push, pushti, nourishment. What is it that nourishes our bhakti? That is the experience of seeing Krishna, of interacting with Krishna. Krishna's sweet words, Krishna's mm, beautiful reciprocations. Huh? This is nourishing. So here, nourishment, pushti, is compared to paresha anubhav, the realizations that the devotee has of Sri Krishna. And then apaya. Mm, should apaya the disappearance of hunger is compared to virakti detachment from the world someone experiences sweetness of sri krishna then naturally he has no interest in the 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 gross and uh, unpleasant pleasures of this world in comparison to the happiness of bhakti the pleasures of this world are very gross and unpleasant actually so here see krishna is saying pratyaksha avagamam dharmyam that uh, it is the nature of bhakti that one experiences the pleasure and the realization of krishna and detachment from this world direct experience but that's to be noted also just as if you only eat a little food you'll still be hungry if you take more food, then your hunger will go away completely. So in the same way, we should understand there's a sliding scale. If a person will do some bhakti, but not full absorption, then they can experience some happiness, perhaps some little realization and some detachment, but not fully. So there are degrees. The more we become absorbed, the more we surrender, the more we engage, then you can be very optimistic and you can fully count on this, that you'll experience more spiritual pleasure, more realization, and naturally become more detached from the material world. So, Pratyakshavaman Dharmyam, Dharmyam means that 
If a person follows his worldly dharmas, then he gets economic development, he gets sense gratification, he gets liberation, all, the, all these things. Uh, but if one will follow this bhakti dharma, he'll not be bereft, bereft of anything. Previously in chapter 8, Sri Krishna has said, Bejeshu yagyeshu tapasu chaiva daneshu yat punya palam pratistam upeti tat sarvam idam bhiditva yogi paranastam upeti chadyam Hey Arjun, if someone follows this path of bhakti and they neglect their Vedic Dharma, they neglect the performance of austerities and studies and uh, giving in charity and all different types of, of uh, pious activities. But still, my devotee will receive the results of all of these activities, even though he's not performing those dharmas. And in addition to that, in the end, he will come to me. So bhakti pratyakshavagamam dharmyam susukam kartum abhyayam. Krishna said susukam. Suk means uh, happy and also suk means easy as well. Susukam. It is very joyfully performed and very easily performed. And uh, the reason is, and uh, see Krishna will go on to explain in this chapter, how he's everywhere. You don't have to go anywhere to find him. And how he's very easily satisfied. See, Krishna will explain in this chapter, Oh, my dear devotees, Patram pushpam palam tayam yo me bhaktya priyachati hmm? That if you offer to me with love a leaf, a fruit, a flower, or even just some water, then I accept it. Then, Tadasya Bhakti Paritam Ashnami Prayatatmanaha Prayatatmanaha Here, Prayatatmana means if you offer it to me with a pure heart. If someone doesn't have devotion, Krishna is not interested in what they do. But if someone has Bhakti, that Bhakti Shakti is entered into his pran, into his chittavriti, into the movements of his mind and the movements of his senses, then Krishna is satisfied even if you just give a little water. So in this world, all the other paths, for example, trying to please your family members, <laughs> trying to please the, the demigods, and so these are very complicated and difficult things. But Krishna is so soft-hearted, so gentle, so grateful that to please him is very, very easy. So in this chapter, Sri Krishna is opening his heart and saying, oh, just give me a little water, a fruit, a flower. These things are just available everywhere for free at no expense. See, Krishna himself has made flowers growing in nature here and there. Uh, so, see, Krishna is expressing here is lal and icha. Lal and icha means, icha means desire. And lalana means... Um, to to pamper. Hmm? So Krishna has a desire to be pampered by his devotees. You know, if you love someone, then you pamper them. If they go to sit down, you give them so many nice cushions. Hmm? You always supply them with, uh, make sure that it's not too hot, not too cold, fan them and uh, give them warm clothing if it's cold. Uh, give them delicious food, many different types of food, massage, everything. So this is, if you love someone, you just pamper them and you feel great joy. So Krishna has his lal and icha. Krishna has a desire to be pampered by his devotees. When One, one could say, well, that's very vain. <laughs> but see, Krishna has no desire for sense gratification. But rather, when the devotee pampers Krishna, when he gives pleasure to Krishna, then though Krishna feels pleasure from this pampering, for sure, but the devotee experiences a hundred times, or depending on the devotee, in the case of Radharani, when Srimati Radharani is pampering Sri Krishna, she feels 10 million times more happiness than Sri Krishna feels. <laughs> so Krishna's lalanicha, his desire to be pampered is not a vanity, but it's his, it's his greed, it's his thirst. It's his um, great uh, covetousness 
to give joy to his devotees. So here, see, Krishna says, Susu kam kartamavayam. This bhakti is joyfully performed, very joyfully and very easily. And avyayam means it's everlasting. It goes on forever. Not like the sadhanas, other types of sadhana. The sadhana of karma uh, is when you get the results, then you give up that practice. The sadhana of jnana, when you're liberated in Brahman, then you no longer do that sadhana. The sadhana of yoga also. All other types of practices are relinquished once the goal is attained. But bhakti is the practice and bhakti is the goal. Mm -hmm. Though the, the way to make progress is to engage in devotion to Krishna. And when that devotion is perfect, then you engage in more devotion and more beautifully, most perfectly. So that is the uh, in Siddha Rup. Seva Sadaka Rupena Siddha Rupena Chatrahi. As one's devotion matures, then the devotee receives his Siddha there, his perfected spiritual body. And that perspective spiritual body is always sinking into the joy, joyful ocean of loving service at the lotus feet of Radha and Krishna in the Nikunjas of Vrindavan. So we see here in chapter 9, Sri Krishna is feeling great joy to, to reveal to Arjuna and to reveal to the world, the whole world, through Arjuna, the glories of Shuddha Bhakti. Vali Vrindavan Bihari Lala Ki Jai Varasani Wali Ki Jai 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 Sri Radhe Shah.